Welcome to Mission Majima Ajahn. Ajahn. So tell us about the Akan Kaya Sutta, Majima number six. So the Akan Kaya Sutta, which roughly translates as if a bhikkhu should wish, is the Buddha basically um, describing these 17 aspirations which a uh, renunciant might have everything from the most basic of gaining enough requisites to communal harmony, being dear and agreeable to one's companions in the holy life, to these increasingly rarefied um, attainments of the mind and heart, everything from putting aside fear and dread to attaining the four jhanas, these deep states of concentration, to the four formless attainments, and then the four levels of awakening and complete liberation. And for each of these aspirations, he basically gives the same formula for how one should develop in that uh, path, basically saying one should uh, develop these five qualities. One should fulfill the precepts, be devoted to internal serenity of mind, uh, not neglect jhana or meditation, be possessed of wisdom or insight, and uh, delight or dwell in empty huts. And um, he finishes the sutta or and begins it by encouraging the monastics to remain restrained in the Padi Moka. So that's kind of the bookends for the entire discourse. So um, yeah, it has a bit less setting um, or narrative arc than some of the previous sutras we've come across. And yet it's also a profoundly practical and really useful um, kind of teaching. So what highlights would you draw out from the teaching, Ajahn? Mm. Yeah, just personally, I love those five wish-fulfilling qualities or five wish-fulfilling practices. Um, those five fall under the rubric of what are called the three higher trainings. So the training in higher virtue, which is what you know, being possessed of virtue falls under. Um, the training in higher mind, which is what uh, devotion to internal serenity of mind and uh, not neglecting meditation fall under, and um, the training in higher wisdom, which um, not yeah, uh, being possessed of insight or vipassana, and that final quality, um, dwelling in empty huts, kind of straddles both the training in mind, higher mind, and higher wisdom. Hmm. And one, I just appreciate the Buddha singling uh, that last one out of dwelling in huts and that that could be a cause for, uh, you know, people, you know, being dear and agreeable to mm. one's friends in the holy life. That's kind of fascinating. Just getting out of, you know, getting out of their hair. And, um, even though, uh, we, we don't, don't have any, we don't have any hair. So it shouldn't be hard, mm. but can be. Um, so appreciate that. One other thing is just the word fear, the concept of fear. It comes up in two different opposite ways in this sutta. So it, it occurs in those bookends that you mentioned, where the Buddha encourages monastics to be perfect in precepts, in, in sila, and to see fear, bhaya, or danger. Mm. Same word, fear or danger, in the slightest of faults. Mm. So this is a training in learning to accurately see you know, danger where there is danger. Mm. Um, so it's a wholesome fear that the Buddha is actually encouraging. Whereas when we practice these things, um, it's said that one of the results will be uh, that we overcome fear and dread. Mm. So that's overcoming the unwholesome fear and dread that aren't part of the path. So mm. quite interesting. That's great. And what about you, Ajahn? What do you find interesting about this sutta? One of the qualities or one of the aspirations, the wishes that he points to is, if one should wish when my relatives pass, may they remember me with faith and it be of great benefit. And I think this is really the Buddha pointing to the practice of dedicating merit to the dead and doing good and then remembering those who have passed and saying this can affect them. And I find this so heartening to know that for me, this is the Buddha saying that even if during our life, someone we love might be cut off or not open to our practice, um, maybe the personality or conditioning or views keep them from appreciating what we're trying to do, that after death, there's a clarity that can really allow them to understand the beauty of, um, of what you've been cultivating and it can really benefit them. So it's so beautiful to see that singled out because many people have parents or children or friends or lo loved ones who, 
who don't value exactly what they do with their practice, but it doesn't mean it won't eventually be of service to them. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, and what about uh, any new elements that we're coming across for the first time in this sutta? What are the kind of novel pieces? Yeah, two novel new elements as we progress through the Majjhima. Um, one is it's the first mention of the six abhinya, the chalabhinya, which are one different psychic powers, which are basically um, manipulation of the elements. Mm-hmm. So being able to make the sky like earth so you can step on it or make water like earth so you can walk across it or to make the earth like water so you can dive in and out mm-hmm. of it. Then you've got clear audience or the divine ear where you can hear divine and human sounds. You've got telepathy, being able to read the minds of other people, knowing their different mental states. Then you've got uh, knowledge of past lives, uh, clairvoyance, where mm-hmm. you can see how beings pass away and are reborn according to their kama. And then the destruction of the asavas, mm-hmm. uh, attainment of our hardship. It's also the first uh, instance, I believe, so far in the progression of mentioning the four different types of enlightened beings. Mm. So Sotapanna, that is the, the stream enter, the Sakadagami, the once returner, the Anagami, the non-returner, mm. and the Arhat. We did find the Arhat mentioned in the Mulaparyaya, along with the Seka, which are people in training, mm. which is those first three, but they weren't explicitly named. So those are new elements. One old element, though, is worth mentioning, is that here... And in other suttas, actually, that we've encountered, the Buddha mentions, says, bhikkhuve, which translates as, O monks, or O bhikkhus, uh, whereas Bhante Nalio has made a good case that there are discourses where the Buddha uses that term as a catch-all for whatever practitioners mm-hmm. are listening. He kind of addresses this in this vocative uh, addressing form. Um, he says, bhikkhuve, bhikkhus, that is, uh, monastics, but he means just everyone. So hmm. I think this, along with many of the other suttas, are applicable to, yeah, if you're living among practitioners, then if you want to be dear and agreeable to them, then fulfill the precepts and uh, devote yourself to internal serenity of mind. Don't neglect meditation. Be possessed of insight and dwell in empty huts. So hmm. that's great. Hmm. And Ajahn, what about the setting? What was so, yeah, actually, I think the setting is really um, worth just looking at briefly. And it, this discourse takes place in Savati, um, as have the previous discourses we've read so far. Um, one takes place near Savati, uh, if not in it. And Savati, it's a very important um, setting. 75 of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya take place in or near Savati, about half of them. The Buddha spent 25 rains retreats in the city, and it was the capital of Kosala, one of two large kingdoms in northern India. Um, it's the home of King Pasenadi, the uh, a really fascinating character who the Buddha has a lot of dialogue with. He's initially quite ambivalent about the Buddha, but eventually gains a huge amount of faith. Um, in uh, Savati, you have the Lady Visaka, Anattapindika, the two foremost givers among uh, or donors among the laity um, and the vassal state of Kosala was Sakya where the Buddha was from um, so it's just useful to get a picture of this state and just to the south there was Magadha the other great kingdom the capital of which was Rajagaha ruled over by King Bimbisara so that's definitely a worthwhile setting to keep in mind as well so Ajahn what is our word of the week? Our word of the week is patimoka. And that comes from the root mok, which is free. And it is the sort of code of training that the monastics abide by. And its root is freedom. And hopefully that's its end as well. So, yeah. All right. Well, we'll see all of you if you're tuning in first day on Sunday. Then stick around afterwards. We'll see you on Zoom. And... We'll also see you next week for Majima number seven. Ajahn. Okay.